Hi, this is Nick Bizai, and this is the distribution system operator video that I am recording based off of a set of slides that I did for the recent OTCO distribution system webinar. We didn't record those, we just showed the slides, and you can get the slides by going to uh, the OTCO website, looking for the uh, downloadable PDF slides that were posted on 11 5 2020. Let me uh, record this for you today so you have this. This is hydraulics for distribution system operators. And you can see that this was a water distribution seminar. There's the ATCO uh, contact hour provider number, the contact hours, uh, November 5, 2020. Okay, so what we were looking at was hydraulics for operators in basic terms. And uh, I'll move my screen out of the way here so I can see what I'm doing. In order to provide drinking water to our customers, we frequently find ourselves in a position of having to move water from one point to another, and sometimes from a lower elevation to a higher elevation in our distribution systems. But to do that, in order to describe the work that we're doing, we need to know some terminology and the characteristics about that movement, such as, and I put everything in green that you need to know. For example, how much water is being moved from one point to another, and of course, we're talking about volume, we're talking about flow rates there. How fast is the water going to where we want it to go? That's velocity and those sometimes detention times. What size is the cross-sectional area that the flow moves across? Is it going through a pipe or a channel or something? That's an area. So we got to know a little bit about areas. And then how much energy do we need to move that water? So high horsepower, pressure, and head. So everything in green there is what I'm going to try to cover today on a basic level for operators. So the symbols for these eight terms that I just mentioned, and you see in the first column on the left, we got area, volume, flow rate, velocity, detention time, head pressure, and horsepower. The symbols for those are highlighted there in that column. So for area, we use A, for volume, we use BOL, flow rate Q, velocity V. Notice that I got a couple of words that start with V, so I, one of them I'm calling BOL, the other V, just to keep them uh, separated from one another. The third column is that sometimes the way they're expressed is, for example, area shown as A is expressed as cubic inches sometimes, sometimes cubic feet, sometimes cubic meters. And there's a couple of formulas I put that often go with area, like times the width, for example, or 0.75 times the diameter squared, those kind of things. So you can refer back to this table if you need to by reversing the video or dragging the bar backwards. There's a conversion chart that I put in there that you would need for the math problems that I'm gonna show on the, on the video today. For example, if you wanted to do cubic feet and change it to gallons, you'd multiply by 7.48. So I set this chart up so that you always multiply, you never divide. Anything on the left has to be multiplied by that middle column to obtain the volume on the right or the value on the right. Okay, so the basics of distribution math. Most of the math problems that we face in distribution rely on at least one of the same four recurring components. So the more you know about those components, the better off you're gonna be. So I'm gonna cover them at length today. We can learn a few simple points about those four components. We can handle most of the math. The four recurring components are these, area and volume, time and distance. Believe it or not, every math problem you do on a distribution system exam is gonna involve at least one of those concepts. So let's learn them. Area. Now vessels like channels, pipes, tanks, anything that stores or carries water in our distribution system is gonna have a cross-sectional area. And we need to be able to calculate that. Area is always two-dimensional. We have to multiply those two dimensions together. And the result is always going to be in square units. For example, I have a square that is five feet by five feet. I multiply them together and I get 25 square feet. Example area of a circle that has a diameter of five feet has an area of five feet by five feet multiplied by 0.785 or 19.65, 625 square feet. Now, when we do volume, we're gonna add that third dimension. We're gonna calculate the area. We're gonna add a third dimension and we're gonna get cubic something or other. The pipes and tanks and reservoirs hold a volume of water. Those are in cubic units. So the terms that we use for like Things like rectangle and circle now become rectangular and circular when we describe the vessels that are constructed by layers or stacks of these areas. So imagine a bunch of circular identical areas. 
stacked up on top of one another. By themselves, they just have two dimensions. They're flat and no dimension going up or down. If you start stacking a bunch of them on top of one another, now you're getting that third dimension. You're getting a depth or a height or whatever you want to call it. Now you have three dimensions. You have a volume. By the way, where does this 0 0.785 come from? I get asked that a lot. I'll show you how, that, how they came up with that a long time ago. Okay, here's your square area. Say we have a square as an area equal times the length times the width. We know that. So let's say that we have a five foot width of this thing and a five foot length or depth of this thing. I multiply the five times the five, I get the 25 square feet. Well, it works the same way for a circle with some adjustment. The circular area has the same length and width as the square. If it fits perfectly within the square, it's going to have an area that's 78.5% of the square. And here's how that works. There's your square. There's the circle circumscribed in it perfectly. So the five foot section comes across there. Another five foot section comes across there. Same length, same width. We call that a, a radius or a diameter, of course. So the area is going to be length times the width times 7.785 or 19.625 square feet because we've lopped off 78, uh, 25, a little over 22% of the uh, corners. That's how that works that way. Of course, you can use pi multiplied by the radius squared. <clears throat> and since the radius is one half of diameter, when we square the one half, we get one fourth. So pi has to be four times the 0.785 or 3.14. That's where that comes from. That's simple. Or maybe complex if you look at it, depending on how you want to look at it. So time and distance. Time is universal, at least from our daily perspective, notwithstanding what Einstein tried to teach us. For our perspective, we can consider it universal. When we get into that, we need to know these these uh, these uh, conversions here: 60 seconds in one minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, and 30 or 31 days for most months, except for February, of course. When it comes to distance, things get a little bit more complicated. I'll admit that. It can be tricky. Sometimes we have to go back and forth between the English and the metric system. I'm going to show you quickly how to do that, a little bit about that. Here's a ruler with inches on one side and centimeters on the other. One of the things you should memorize is that there are 2.54 centimeters in an inch. So 2.54 centimeters equals 25.4 millimeters. The other distance you want to know is that one meter is 39.37 inches. And of course, we know that there's 36 inches in a, in a yard. One inch equals 2.54 centimeters. One meter is 39.37 inches. One inch is, of course, equal to foot, three yards, three feet in a yard, 5,280 feet in one mile. The more you know about the relationship between time and distance, the better off you're going to be able to do these problems. So if you can memorize this page or at least become very familiar with it, you'll be better off. So here's some examples of, of the four components showing up in calculations. I'm not going to do these calculations right now. I just want to show you that as a distribution operator, these are the kind of questions you find yourself asking. And you need those four components to do the problems. How many gallons of water are held in a six inch pipe if it's 850 feet long? No, well, that's area and depth. How long does it take to empty a half a million gallon storage tank if you keep the flow rate coming out of it at 300 gallon per minute? There's time, there's volume. How many cubic yards of soil have to be excavated from a trench? There's the distance of the trench, there's the area, volume. Low velocity in eight inch main is two and a half feet per second, there's time. So all of these questions you tend to ask yourself in distribution system involve those four, one of more of those four components. Is that good, Cleveland water? <clears throat> all right, so the use of conversion factors, a little bit about that. Sometimes we have to use conversion factors in our calculations. Conversion factor is an arithmetical multiplier. Remember that table I showed you, you always multiply by the conversion factor. You set it up properly, you never have to divide, just multiply. That converts a quantity expressed in one set of units to an equivalent set of other units. You don't change the length or the volume or anything like that, you just express it differently. The same value, just a different way of expressing it. Conversion chart was provided early on, as I mentioned. You can access that by reversing your video to go back to that. Here's an example of a conversion factor. Let's say you have a container that's holding 1.25 cubic feet of water. How many gallons is this? Well, I need to know a conversion factor. In this case, it's every cubic foot of water is 7.48 gallons. Well, I don't have one cubic feet of water. I got 1.25 cubic feet of water. 
If I multiply times the 7.8 conversion factor, I get 9.35 gallons. So 7.48 is the conversion factor. It never changes. Uh, it always stays the same. You just multiply it times the original value to get the other value, a different way of expressing it. But let's look at the um, those eight men mentioning components that I mentioned and uh, show you how they work. The first one we'll look at is volume, volume or BOL. Here's an example of volume calculation with the conversion factor. So you got a day tank, you're using it to feed a liquid chemical. The day tank measures four feet by three feet and is filled to the two foot level. How much liquid in cubic feet is being held? You set it up as four feet by three feet by two feet. So I've taken the area of it, multiplied by the depth of it, which is the Q, the two, and I get 24 cubic feet. How many gallons is that day tank holding? Well, now I know how many cubic feet, so now I need the conversion factor. I'm gonna take the gallons, multiply by the appropriate conversion factor, which was 7.48, as we just found out. When I multiply them together, I get the answer of 179.52 gallons. So we had a calculation that involves area, converted to volume, and converted to another way of expressing it by multiplying by the conversion factor. Another volume calculation for distribution operators. We have a tank up on a pedestal. We got a long, a long uh, pipe supporting it and filling it from the bottom. They're not asking about that. They're just wanting to know about the tank itself up on top. So how many gallons does this tank hold <clears throat> if it is 40 feet tall and 50 feet wide? <clears throat> Notice they're not giving you any dimensions on the pipe. When they don't give you any dimensions on the pipe, you don't have to do anything. Don't, don't try to guess. Don't try to do anything with that arithmetically. Just doing the volume of the tank itself. And the tank looks like a big, wide pipe. So we're going to use the same formula that we do we would with a pipe. Um, a reservoir like this, it just happens to be wider than it is tall, whereas a pipe is usually longer than it is wide. So how many gallons will this tank hold if it's 40 feet tall, 50 feet wide? Ignore the pipe section. Volume is area times height. Volume equals 0 0.785 times the 50 and 50 times 40 feet height. I'm coming up with 78,500 cubic feet. If I can convert those cubic feet to gallons, I have to have a conversion factor. And here it's 7.48 gallons per cubic foot again. And I come up with about 587,180 gallons. Here's another volume calculation. We're putting in some pipe into the ground. It says it's a new 30 inch main. I'm installing it and I have to fill it up for pressure testing. If it's 500 feet long, 1500 feet long, how much water is it gonna to take to fill it up? Well, that's something as a distribution operator I ought to be able to do. I'm going to measure the volume of that tank by multiplying 0 0.785 times the diameter squared times 1,500 feet. I come up with about 7,360 cubic feet. Multiply that by the conversion factor, and I get about 55,048 gallons. Now, notice this symbol here, this wavy line. When you see that symbol, it means approximately equal to. doesn't mean it's exactly equal to. If it's straight lines, it's equal. This is just wavy lines, it means I round it off somewhere, just approximately that much. All right, how about flow rates? Q. The flow rate or rate of flow <clears throat> is a term used in hydraulics that describes the amount of water flowing for a unit of time. In the water system, the math we use in flow rate calculations often assigns the symbol Q to denote the flow rate. So let's remember. Q, rate of flow. Flow rate or Q must be calculated by determining two things. I've got to have an area across which the flow is moving, the square foot area of the tank or the vessel, the pipe, whatever. And I've got to have the speed or velocity at which the water is actually flowing. So the square foot area, the square, cube, the square meter area, whatever you're working with, and how fast is that area moving down through the pipe or the vessel. The formula for flow rate is always equals Q equals A times V, or the area multiplied by the velocity. And some things to remember when we're using that formula, Q equals A V. The area of the vessel is going to need to be calculated. The vessel through which the water is flowing being calculated typically in a pipe or a channel. So the pipe we're using the formula pi r squared or 0 0.785 times the diameter squared. And it occurs for the rectangular channel. The area is always equal to the depth times the width or the height. Area and velocity units must match. If I'm going to do a Q equal AB problem, I've got to have units matching. If the area is in square feet, 
The velocity has to be in feet per unit time, for example, feet per second. Can't have cubic something or other without knowing that it's feet or meters or whatever. You cannot multiply square inches by feet per second. You must convert the other to have them the same. You may need to convert inches back and forth between gallons per minute, cubic feet per second, for example. So go back to the conversion chart. The area relation between circular and rectangular vessels. So the rectangular channel flow looks like this. We've got the face of that channel looking at us. We've got length times the width. And I've got an area that way by multiplying the two together. In a pipe or a cylinder, it's the same thing. I've got an area delineated by that circle that cuts out the inside of the pipe that way. We're moving it across the pipe that way. So I've got two dimensions and I multiply that times 0.785 to get the area. So here's a flow rate calculation for you. A flow rate or rate of flow provides us with the information about the amount of water moving through unit of time, as I mentioned. The symbol is Q. So for distribution system hydraulics, the flow rate most commonly seen are million gallons per day, gallons per minute, and cubic feet per second. So get used to seeing those three or three, four acronyms that I put down there that explain that. So MGD is million gallons per day, for example. GPM is gallons per minute. So you'll know what they are. It's an example flow rate calculation. They're asking us how many gallons per minute are flowing through a 16 inch water main if the velocity in the pipe is two and a half feet per second. I'm gonna use the formula Q, <coughs> Q equals A times V. Since they're asking us for an answer in gallon per minute, I'm gonna convert the diameter of the main to feet. I'm taking that 16 inch water main, and multiplying it by the conversion factor, one foot over 12 inches, <coughs> and I get 1.33 feet. So the area of a 16 min inch main is 0 0.785 times 1.33 feet squared or 1.389 square feet. And Q equals 1.389 square feet times 0.25 feet per second or about 3.47 cubic feet per second. And I take that cubic feet per second, multiply by 60 seconds in a minute, and 7.48 gallons per cubic foot, I get about approximately, remember there's the wavy line again, approximately 1,560 gallons per minute. And what about velocity? We show that in our formula is V, the common units are feet per second or meters per second. I'm doing velocity. It's a term we use in hydraulics that describes the speed of water flowing for a given unit of time. In water systems, the math we use in velocity calculations often assigns the symbol V to denote speed or velocity. <clears throat> for velocity or V has to be calculated by determining two things the area or A of the vessel through which the water is flowing, oops, all right, and the flow rate Q of the water moving through the vessel. So the formula for velocity is gonna be Q divided by A, the flow rate divided by the square foot area. By its nature, the velocity formula suggests an average weight of many velocities. Think about that a minute. When you calculate a velocity, you're getting an average speed of all of the water moving through that pipe, for example. Not all, all of the velocities are the same for every drop of water. Every drop of water in that pipe is moving independently practically from everything else. It's moving at a different speed. Uh, the water moving along the sidewall of the pipe is experiencing fluid drag, so it's moving a little slower. That means the water in the middle must be moving a little faster. By average, when you average them all the speeds together, that's the answer you're gonna get when you use this formula. So realize when you do a velocity calculation form, formula using Q equal A times V or A, uh, V equal Q over A, it's always an average, so keep that in mind. It's important to understand that every drop of water flow column, as I mentioned, is moving at different speeds, so they average out to the V. All right, the velocity equation. You may have noticed that the velocity equation looks a lot like the equation used for flow rate, Q equals A times V. That's because it is the same equation, simply arranged to calculate V, not Q. We just flip things around a bit. So as such, we're gonna use the same principles that apply to velocity that apply to Q. We need to find the square area of the vessel through which the water is flowing. And for cylinders, we're going to use the 0 0.785 times the diameter squared. And for rectangular channels, we're going to use the width times the depth. The velocity, things you need to remember when you're using that formula V equal Q over A. The area of the vessel will need to be calculated, of course. Vessel through which the velocity is being calculated is typically a pipe or a channel. 
it's a pipe, if it's a cylinder, using the pi r squared of 0 0.785 times the diameter squared. For the rectangle, we use the depth times the width. Area and flow units have to match, just like everything else. If area is in square feet, the flow must be in cubic feet per minute, cubic feet per second, that type of thing. You cannot divide gallon per minute by square feet. You must convert the gallon per minute to cubic feet per unit of time. You may need to convert answers back and forth between feet per second and centimeters per minute or something like that. So be prepared to use those tables I gave you. So here's some velocity calculations. Example of a velocity calculation look like this. What is the water velocity in feet per second in a 0 0.19625 square foot pipe if the water is moving through it with a flow rate of 0 0.589 cubic feet per second? Seems a little difficult, but it's not. Just plug in your formula. V equals Q over A. It's a formula we used. We gave you the area of the pipe is 0 0.19625 square feet. So that was given. We have A. The flow rate was given. We have Q, 0 0.589 cubic feet per second. I'm going to take the velocity of 0 0.589 cubic feet per second divided by 0 0.1965 square feet. Those square feet are going to cancel out square feet in the numerator, leaving me in feet per second. And that comes out to about three. Notice that the square feet in the denominator cancel out the square feet in the numerator, as I just said. Only leaves you with feet per second. So if you keep your units set up, you should have no problem with these kind of issues here. Velocity in the circular and rectangular vessels. I'm going to look at rectangular channel velocity first. I showed you something like this drawing a little bit earlier. I'm going to show it to you again and then that third dimension. There was the square face of the channel, the rectangular face of the channel we saw with water moving towards you. We calculated the area by, by multiplying the width times the depth. Now I've got that third dimension of velocity. It works the same thing in a pipe when water is moving at the rate of speed that velocity shows you that be there. The faster you move that area through that channel or through that pipe, the greater the velocity and the greater the amount of water you're displacing. So here's velocity calculation and conversion. What is the velocity in, a, in feet per second in a 24 inch water main where the water is flowing at 6,060 gallons per minute? So V equals Q over A, the area of a 24 inch main is A equals 0 0.785 times two times two or 3.14 square feet. The flow rate was given to you as 6,060 6, gallon per minute. So V equals Q over A, 6,060 gallon per minute divided by 3.1 square, square feet. That's not gonna work. You're gonna have to convert something because you can't divide gallons, uh, gallons per minute by square feet of anything. It's gotta work differently. So I'm gonna use the conversion factor Multiply the one minute over 60 seconds times the 6,060 gallon per minute. Convert that out, I'm going to get 13 and a half cubic feet per second. B equal Q over A, then I got 13 and a half cubic feet per second divided by 3.14 square feet. The square feet are going to cancel out in the numerator and the denominator, leaving me in feet per second, and I come up with about 4.3 feet, 4.3 feet per second. Here's another example of velocity calculation. Again, determine the velocity and flow feet per second in a 24 inch water main if the flow in it is 1,475 gallons per minute. So again, I'm using the formula V equal Q over A. And since they are asking for feet per second, I'm gonna have to make a conversion from gallons to cubic feet and from minutes to seconds. So I got a couple of conversions I gotta deal with here. There I set it up to gallons per minute, dividing by the 7.48 gallons in 60 seconds in a minute, I'm gonna come up with 3.286 cubic feet per second. 24 inch main is a two foot diameter main. V equals 3.286 cubic feet per second divided by the, the area. I'm getting 1.05 feet per second. Now let's look at detention time. I'm going to write that as D sub T. The typical units are going to be in seconds or minutes or hours or days. So detention time calculations. Detention time calculations tell us the time that it takes for a given volume of water to flow from one, from one vessel to another, or a pipe or a tank. And the symbol that we use to denote time is D sub T. Well, the formula for detention time always equals D equals volume divided by the flow rate, or volume over Q. Always, detention time always equals the volume divided by the flow rate. If you can remember that, you should have no problems with detention time problems. D e sub T is the time in standard units. It's going to be seconds, minutes, hours, or days. And volume is the amount of water contained in the vessel. 
and Q is the rate of flow entering or leaving the vessel. So here's some examples of detention time problems. Let's say you got a 240,000 gallon storage tank and it's being drained for inspection. It is emptying at a rate of 325 gallon per minute. How long will it take to empty this tank? Do you have to sit around and wait for this or can you go do something else while this thing is draining because you got a lot of time? This is why you gotta be able to calculate these kind of problems. I'm gonna take the detention time formula and write volume divided by flow rate is gonna give me my answer. The volume of the tank was given to us at 240,000 gallons. So I've got the volume. And I'm emptying the tank at a rate of 325 gallon per minute. I'm gonna take the volume divided by the flow rate. That's gonna simply come up to 738 minutes or that's about a half a day. So I should have plenty of time to go do something else. So here's some things to remember when you're using the formula detention time equals the volume divided by the flow rate. The volume of the tank or pipe is always in the numerator on top of the fraction. The flow rate of the water moving into the tank or through the pipe is always in the denominator or the bottom of the fraction. It's always gonna be that way for detention time calculations. The time and volume units must match. If detention times in minutes, then the flow rate used in the calculation must be the same time frame cubic feet per minute or gallon per minute. Can be hours, can be days, you gotta change it. Volume and flow rate must also match. You cannot divide gallons by cubic feet per second nor can you divide cubic feet by gallon per minute. You have to convert one to the other. You remember those conversions when you do these. Here's a detention time calculation using a conversion. I have a flow rate of 0 0.3 cubic feet per second. I'm using it to fill a 75 gallon tank. How long is it gonna take me to fill that tank? Well, detention time equals the volume by the, divided by the flow rate always. It's gonna be 75 gallons divided by the 0 0.3 cubic feet per second. And that doesn't work. I have to make a conversion first. I can't divide gallons by cubic feet. We we'll convert the gallons to cubic feet first. And I took the 7.48 gallons equals one cubic feet. So 75 gallons divided by 7.48 is about 10 cubic feet. The detention time equals the volume divided by the flow rate or 10 cubic feet divided by the 0 0.3 cubic feet per second, or about 33 seconds. All right, detention time calculations using conversion. Example, here's a detention time calculation where a 50 gallon per minute pump is used to fill up a new six inch water main that is 450 feet long. How long will it take to fill this main? Detention time always equals the volume divided by the flow rate. Sorry about that. So the volume of the pipe is 0 0.785 times 0.5 feet times 0.5 feet times 450 feet length, multiplied by the conversion factor 7.48 gallons per cubic feet. So I come up with about 660 gallons. Flow rate is stated as 50 gallon per minute. <clears throat> so the detention time is gonna equal <coughs> 660 gallons divided by 50 gallon per minute or about 13.2 minutes. So here's an example of detention time calculation also. How long will it take to fill an empty cylindrical storage tank that is 28.5 feet in diameter and 34 feet in height if you're filling it at a rate of 475 gallon per minute? And they want you to give your answers in hours and minutes. So you're taking an exam, you have four multiple choices. Uh, they'll, they'll want the answer in hours per minute. You, have, you gotta pick the right answer. Here's how you do a problem like that. I'm gonna use the formula the detention time equals the volume divided by the flow rate. They're gonna have to make a conversion between gallons and cubic feet. I'm also going to have to change the hours to minutes. I'm going to take the 475 gallon per minute divided by the 7.48. I get 63.5 cubic feet per minute. So the detention time equals 0 0.785 times the 28.5 squared times the 34 feet in height divided by the 63.5 cubic feet per minute. Now, detention time equals the 341.4 minutes or 5.69 hours which is five hours and 0 0.69 times 60 minutes, or five hours and 41 minutes. Notice that when I come out with hours expressed as a whole number and a decimal number, 5.69, I've got to take that 0.69 and multiply it by the fact that there are 60 minutes in an hour. When I do that, I come up with five hours and 41 minutes. It'll trick you and give you an answer that says five hours and 69 minutes. Oh, well, check that answer, that's, that's wrong. You got to make the conversion. A little bit about head and pressure, and then we'll finish up. Head and pressure is seen as pounds per square inch or feet or feet of head. And here's some calculations between head and pressure. We kind of use them interchangeably, but uh, you got to know a little bit about them before you can do that. 
So when we're talking about head for practical purpose, head is the pressure at any given point in a water system. It's calculated as the pressure exerted by a hypothetical column of water with a free surface rising in a column above the hydraulic system itself. So you got a pipe sticking up in the air of unspecified height. There's no top to it, so there's no pressure on it. The pressure is coming from the bottom, pushing water up to a certain height. It'll reach a certain pressure and stay there. That's the head. It is usually expressed as feet, but sometimes as meters. Pressure. Pressure is described as the force pushing against the unit area, or pounds per square inch or something like that. I'm going to express as that, sometimes feet of head, sometimes meters of head. So there's head and there's pressure explained a little bit. How do we work between them? Let's look. You got to know the conversion factors. These go back and forth. One pound per square inch equals 2.31 feet of head. What that means is if you got a column of water <clears throat> and the bottom of the column says 1.1 pound per square inch on a, on a measurable gauge, then the column of water must be 2.31 feet high. The other one says one foot of head equals 0.433 PSI. That means if you got a column of water that's one foot in height, pressure gauge at the bottom would read 0 0.433. That's the conversion factor. So moving rider right around the system. We started this module by saying that in order to provide drinking water to our customers, we have to move water from one point to another and sometimes water from a lower elevation to a higher elevation. On its own, water won't move anywhere because it has inertia. It sits still in a container unless we work to move it. The water itself doesn't move on its own. Why? Well, it's heavy. For one thing, it weighs 8.34 pounds per gallon, but gravity is going to work on it. Also, it takes up space. 7.48 gallons takes up a cubic foot of space. If left alone. So you got this water taking up space, gravity pulling on it. It's not going anywhere unless you do overcome gravity in that space, move it out of that space. <clears throat> so we had to invent devices to help us do that, to help us provide water, help us move water from point A to point B. We first came up with things like water wheels and draft animals and oxes and horses and things like that. Then we finally got around to inventing a pump to move it and pipes and tanks to contain it. That's how our water system basically works. So if we're going to get into pumping water, we tend to think of a pump as a machine that moves water, a certain volume of water per unit of time. And we're right to think that, but let me teach you a few things about that a little bit. In order to talk about amount of work done when a pump moves water, we have to focus on the weight of the water that we're moving. We have to do that over a specified elevation or distance or the head that I mentioned to you earlier. And we have to do that over a certain interval of time. So really when you're pumping water, you're going to do some work and that work is going to be defined as how much does the volume of water weigh, what is the head pressure that we're overcoming, and how much time do we have to do it in. Those three things define the work done on water by a pump. In fact, the formula for work done by a pump, which we call horsepower, by the way, does just that. It calculates the power needed to move weight of water up a hill uh, against the head in that time interval. So here's horsepower, seen as HP. The formula most often shown to us on exams for calculating horsepower is horsepower equals the gallon per minute times the head over 3960. But that's really a shortened form of the original formula, which came about at a time when we hadn't developed steam power or electrical power, but we used draft horses to move water. That's why they called it horsepower. Back then it was gallon, horsepower equals the gallons per minute multiplied by the weight of water, 8.34 pounds per gallon. So now we've gotten pounds per minute times the head and feet divided by the fact that one horsepower equals 33,000 foot-pounds. So think about it, if a horsepower equals 33,000 foot-pounds, you're taking gallons of water multiplied by 8.34 to convert it to pounds, and you're pushing it at so many head of feet, there's your foot-pounds of work being done. That's where the horsepower formula comes from. You see the draft horse that are doing the work. So a good draft horse could pull 550 pounds of, in a distance of one foot in one second. That was the standard horsepower back then. In one minute, that's 33,000 foot-pounds. And 33,000 foot-pounds divided by the weight of water comes up with a number of about 3960. It's actually 3956, I think, but we've rounded it to 3960. And we use that in our pump formula. Let's look at how we do that. So when we do these horsepower calculations, we typically must find the information we need. We need to find the amount of work, uh, amount of water being pumped or flowing into or out of a vessel. And it needs to be changed in the gallons per minute if necessary. We need to find out how much distance the water is moving or going to move against or which level it moves up to, the head and feet. 
Of course, friction can play a role. It needs to be added to the head if necessary. The elevation of the water on either side of the pump also has to be known. If the math questions ask for deficiencies or factors, you have to be put in the bottom of the horsepower fraction. I'll show you how to do that shortly. Remember when you're using efficiencies, there's no such thing as 100% perfect efficiency. So horsepower efficiency problems are always gonna be something less than one. It'll be a 0.8 or 0.9 or something in between that, usually. So here's an example of a theoretical horsepower calculation. Where we're not worried about efficiencies. We're gonna take the original formula, horsepower, gallon per minute times the head. We're gonna plug in the numbers they gave us. They gave us 580 gallon per minute, pumped up to an elevation of 56 feet. How much horsepower does it take to do that theoretically? Well, 585 times 56 divided by 3960, 8.27 horsepower, perfect. In a perfect world, that's all we'd have to do. So here's another calculator, and before I get to the butt, sorry. Here's another half, horsepower calculation, theoretical. Calculate the horsepower, theoretically, needed to pump at a rate of three cubic feet per second when the discharge pressure is 105 PSI. Now we've got to make some conversions. I take the 105 PSI, convert it to feet of head by multiplying by 2.31. I'm coming up with 242.55 feet. Now we have to change the CFS into gallons per minute in order to do the, the formula. The three CFS multiplies through and I get about 1,340 gallons per minute approximately. I use my formula, I put the 1340 gallon per minute times the 242.55 and divided by the 3960. Theoretically, it would take 82 horsepower to move that much water against that much head. Now, let's go from the theoretical to the real world in pumping calculation. The pump does work. They're rated on the amount of horsepower or HP they need to develop. And horsepower is a function of the pressure that the pump puts out and the amount or flow rate of water they put out. Horsepower calculations always require us to know the amounts of energy lost due to friction and other inefficiencies. So we have to know the elevations also that that affect that head. So a pump is a machine, you think of it this way, a pump is a machine that moves water from a lower elevation to a higher elevation. Pumps basically help us overcome gravity. So in doing so, they're gonna produce heat, produce heat, which is lost energy. You put your hand on that pump or hand on that motor, you're gonna feel heat. That heat is lost energy that's doing you no good for moving water. All of the energy that you put in the system, some of it gets lost. So no, no pumping system is perfectly efficient. But we have to then end up supplying more energy to the pump than theoretically we calculated because some of it we know is gonna get lost through heat and friction and slippage and all kinds of other things. Pumps are inefficient. So here's how you gotta work through that. Pump system efficiencies. The pumping system consists of the pump and the motor that drives it. Each of these experiences some loss of power. So no pump and no motor that drives that pump is 100% efficient. The loss again is due to friction, slippage, heat, and transfer. Each efficiency expressed as a percent and is always less than 100%. It's usually shown as a decimal example. 0.85 is means an 85% efficiency. When you multiply both efficiency of the pump in the motor together, you get an expression called the wire to water efficiency. So if they give you the wire to water efficiency, you should know in your formula that they have multiplied the pump efficiency times the motor efficiency. Example, if the motor horsepower is 85% and the pump efficiency is 92%, the wire to water efficiency is 0.85 times 0 0.92 or 0 0.782, 78.2%. So here's horsepower calculations with efficiencies and conversions in it. Now this is real world stuff. What is the horsepower of a system that is pumping three and a half MGD at 95 PSI if the wire to water efficiency is 86%? I convert my MGD to gallons per minute by taking the three and a half times 694, give me 2,429 gallons per minute. I convert the PSI to head. I take the 95 PSI and multiply it by 2.31 and I come up with 219.45 feet. I go into my horsepower formula and multiply the gallons per minute times the head divided by 3960 times the 86% or 0.86 efficiency. And I come up with 156.5 horsepower. So let's look at these pumping terms. Head terminology, terms used to describe which side of the, the pump you're on and whether the pump is operating. So if you're on the suction side or discharge side of, of the pump, 
These are head terms that are going to describe which side of the pump you're on. So you're going to have suction head and discharge head. If I'm on the suction side, I call it suction head, discharge head, and then there's the discharge side. Now, when it comes to the suction side, you're going to have static head. I'm sorry, when it comes to the pumping system, you're going to have static head, which are your measurements taken on either side of the pump when the pump is not operating. So added together, they become the total static head. So when a pump is sitting still, the water's up in a tank here, and there's a suction side and a pump here. The difference between heads on both sides of the pump when water's not moving is called the static head. Now when a pump moves, it starts moving water. Now we're talking about head as being total dynamic head. It's dynamic, it's moving. The total head being developed by the pump when it operates and the sum of the static head plus the friction head and any efficiencies the pump must overcome. You may see, sometimes you may see the term bowl head for total dynamic head. It's usually in well water systems. Well, here's an example of something. This is when flow, when, uh, when operating, the pump will be flowing from left to right. But this is a static condition. The static suction head on the pump, on the left-hand side of the pump, this is the top of the blue line, the blue elevation in the tank. And the static discharge head is in the blue elevation of the tank on the right. So the difference between those two blue elevations, because water's not moving, the difference between the two is the static head. Because the pump basically wouldn't have to overcome the distance of the pump of the water on the suction side of it. If it worked, it, it's already got water being supplied to it from that suction head. So it doesn't have to do overcome that work. It only has to do it from that level to that level. However, if you have static suction, and that's there's the H here, I'm sorry. You have static suction lift, now that's a different story. Now the suction side water level is below the center line of the pump. Now you got a suction lift rather than a suction head. Now the pump has to overcome that distance plus the static discharge head that it would have to come on the, on the discharge side of the head. So the head difference is the difference between those two elevations. So static hexion, static lift and static suction head, always the difference between the static, uh, the suction side versus the discharge side when water's not moving. Now when water's moving, things get different. This is pump operating with a head loss. So flow when pump is operating, total dynamic head is gonna be the total static head plus the head losses in feet. We're gonna take those elevation differences and we're gonna see up here, the top of the tank on the right-hand side, we've got a distance that would, would have hit if things had been a perfect world. If I did not lose pressure or head due to friction, the water level would have moved that much higher in the tank, but it won't because I've got the inefficiencies to overcome. So that's the difference between real, real world and, and uh, imaginary world of perfect world static head. So for pumping terms for horsepower, here's the terminology that we should use. Horsepower or HP is the amount of work being done. We covered that. There are three components to horsepower. I'm noticing they're going down in, in size as we go down the list. The motor horsepower is the horsepower supplied to the motor in the form of electrical current. Now, out of that motor is going to come in, some of that is going to go in the pump, some of it's going to be lost. So that's going to, what's left over, oh, sorry, is going to be brake horsepower. That's the horsepower supplied to the pump from the motor. And we may use bullhead there too. Now that pump itself is going to lose some heat and lose uh, some slippage in, in the bearings and there's going to be friction loss. So the water, the pressure coming out of that, the energy coming out of that going to the actual water moving is the water horsepower. So each time I go down, I'm losing some of the work that I've, the energy that I put into the system. So we end up looking at, at pump curves, a uh, simple pump curve here to show you where it kind of tells you for each impeller that you have in your pump, these are the kinds of uh, diagrams that you will tell you a little bit about that, that particular pump itself and its capacities. So they're going to give you three curves, an HQ, a PQ, and an EQ curve. The HQ curve is the head curve, the PQ curve is the power curve, and the EQ is the efficiency curve. And here's how to read the chart. You look across the bottom, those numbers from 0 to 22 are the capacity or flow rate Q in, in 100 gallon per minute units. So if I took the 10 on the bottom of that and multiplied by 100, and that would tell me that I'm, at, I'm operating at 1,000 gallons per minute at that point on the bottom of the chart. If you look at the left-hand side of the chart, going up that column goes from zero to 180, that's the total head and feet. If you go on the right side of the chart, going from zero to 90, that's two things. That's the brake horsepower. It's also the pump efficiency. So what the HQ curve tells me, and you can see, you can see on the chart, HQ starts at about 160 when it finally starts putting out water. And that's at about somewhere close to 6, 600 gallon per minute. If I take that six line straight up, 
at 600 gallon per minute, I could say that I must be putting, uh, I must be uh, working against the head of about 160 feet. As I put more and more water out, looking across that 8, 10, 12, 100 gallon per minute, I notice that my head curve starts to go down. So eventually I reach past the 2200 gallon per minute, I reach zero head, there's no more pressure left in the system to run off the curve. The EQ curve is the efficiency curve, and it tells me right here that at about 1400 gallon per minute, I'm the most efficient because the efficiency line always goes up and comes back down. There's a point on that line that I'm at the highest elevation on that chart that tells me where I'm most efficient. So if I run my pump at 1400 gallon per minute, I'm getting the best efficient system that I can possibly get. And the power curve, the PQ curve tells me how much uh, brake horsepower I'm actually putting out of the system and that's right on the right hand side. So uh, that's the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, if you need to get in touch with me, there's some uh, information you can use. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on uh, YouTube with a bunch of other videos. I go to YouTube and look at all the videos I put on that'll help you for preparing for your exams and uh, or see me at, at Twitter or my email address. If you got any questions, please let me know. I'll be happy to answer them for you. And that's today's presentation. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.